thank you so much for coming. And uh, on this beautiful Friday where the sun is shining in an arbor, a rare event in February. Um, and it's probably because of this talk, because uh, we're talking about optical, optoelectronics. So the sun decided to come out also. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, this talk is in a series of talks uh, which are all related around and revolving around this concept of sustainable good life and technology and identifying uh, sort of universally what good life is for people who are very poor to very rich uh, and identifying how technology can play a role in enhancing our ability to have the good life. Everybody wants the good life and developing some kind of framework uh, which is more or less universal uh, comes from study of yoga but uh, interpreted more in today's life. So technology, as we know, extends our limits and offers us almost unlimited possibilities. Uh, we can do things that we could never imagine. Uh, we have at our fingertips knowledge, information that was unimaginable. Uh, and we can carry it with us everywhere we go. So I could be with my uh, smartphone in a village in Africa or India, and I would have at my fingertips the entire encyclopedias, libraries from all over the world, as well as expert ex opinions, uh, which I can draw up anywhere in the world. So it's amazing what technology has done. Uh, so it has enormously extended our abilities. Um, but we are interested more in how does technology contribute to sustainable good life. So just having a lot of choices doesn't mean that uh, our life is good. It could be good, and that's fantastic that there are all these choices. But in addition, something else is also needed, and technology can also help there. So this series of talks is around that concept. Uh, in what areas can technology contribute more? And where are still some challenges which technology has not met? And obviously, technology has provided enormous enhancement to our abilities, both physical abilities as well as intellectual, mental abilities. Uh, we can do things that were unimaginable physically as well as intellectually. But there are many areas where technology has not provided us many. Uh, so for example, in the area of stress, we are as stressed as somebody 2,000 years ago. Right? So how do we handle stress? How do we handle anger? How do we handle interpersonal relationships? Technology has not contributed very much yet. But I personally feel technology has a great role to play over there. And so a lot of things I'll examine. Uh, will involve that. Uh, so today's talk will focus on optoelectronics. And optoelectronics is, uh, and as the title says, enabling technologies of optoelectronics. And optoelectronics plays an extremely central role in our lives because light plays such a central role in our life. Right? So the ability to see, display, the ability to enlighten through knowledge. Uh, so light, sound, light, as well as other senses, sound, hearing, but light is so central to our being. Uh, so optoelectronics deals with light, and uh, it has a cultural impact on us. Uh, if I talk about a microprocessor, um, it's doing wonderful things, but I don't quite have the same feeling for electrons moving in a mi microprocessor and doing these in incredible calculations as I have for a display like this display, for example, which captures for me um, a sunrise in California, and that's me. Uh, and just that image brings such flood of memories to me. So visual impact has this incredible connection to us as human beings. So it can, optoelectronics can play an enormous role in our ability to have the good life. Uh, so just to reiterate this uh, point, optoelectronics is like the culture technology because it interfaces culture with technology. What we see on the television, on the internet, uh, displays, ads, and so on, it, it connects with us in a very human way, which other technologies perhaps don't. Because optoelectronics, right from the birth of humanity, uh, the sunrise, the sunset, lightning, thunder, those kind of things connect very viscerally with us. Uh, we are so swayed by what we see. And people who work in the advertisement, they of course know the power of display. And these are some old uh, 
and you can see these are of course used by tobacco companies, the power of display, how powerful display is. If you can display something, it connects with people, and entire habits, behaviors change through display. Right? Uh, so this, um, you've come a long way. It's a very classic uh, uh, ad for cigarettes. Uh, so understanding the power of display and people who work in uh, media and advertisement understand how powerful an image is, how it connects, grips people, sways them. Uh, now, of course, we can use it the other way also. We can also use images to protect ourselves from certain things. So I'll talk a lot about that. So just as an example, the power of uh, the television, uh, the number of TV uh, viewing hours in USA by everybody is 250 billion. Right? Uh, you can divide it by 300 million or so. You can see how many. So roughly about four hours every day per person, all the time, every day, uh, TV. Uh, the number of 30-second ads watched by children, 20,000 in a year. Right? So it plays an enormous role. Uh, and this is all, of course, optoelectronics in some sense. Uh, and I'll just show you the, again, coming to the power of display, the worldwide advertisement, uh, the revenues or the money spent in media of all kind in display ads. So almost half a trillion dollars. So about, uh, so this is 2009, $421 billion spent on using displays to convince people to buy things, do something. Uh, it has so much power. Uh, just as a contrast, I would point out that Intel, which is one of the most advanced electronics company, its revenue, annual revenue worldwide is about 50 billion. Okay. So this is 423 and projected to rise. And I'm just pointing these out because uh, you can see the biggest growth is coming in video games because uh, that's where technology is moving. Right? Uh, so we understand the power of display, visual impact. And, of course, it impacts it in us in a good way or bad way. Now, the beauty of technology as it's evolving is it's becoming more and more at coming into the hands of individuals. Uh, in the past, technology was held by governments, by corporations, by military organizations. But technology is moving more and more into our hands, like people like you and me. And we can do things and impact technology and impact culture the same way as big Madison Avenue ad companies can do. So if we realize and exercise that power. So the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm showing here, uh, of course spans all the way from X-rays to very long wavelengths. Uh, but we are talking primarily about this visual uh, arena, optoelectronics. When we talk about optoelectronics, primarily we're talking about red to violet type of spectrum. Uh, which connects us, it connects us at a physical level. So you go out in the sun and you feel the sun's warmth on your body and it feels so good. Right? Uh, you, it, it connects our heart. Right? We have memories associated with uh, visualization. A sunrise, a sunset, maybe a starry night. We have such connection with those uh, events. Our very soul is touched by sights we see. If we see the Milky Way, it touches us very deeply. Uh, so optoelectronics, which is, of course, displaying. So nature, of course, produces an incredible display for us all the time. But since we can't always be in nature, uh, optoelectronics provides us the ability to bring that to us. And I'll show you, show you a bunch of uh, beautiful sunrises and sunsets and so on, uh, beautiful images, which are now at our fingertips. Right? You can pull it up on your laptop. Uh, and as technology grows, and I'll, I'll uh, try to uh, gauge some of the trends in technology where basically this entire wall could be sunrise from anywhere in the world and those technologies are coming. Um, but uh, the important thing is our very strong connection and therefore our very strong connection of how we live with light. And that, that is a very uh, interesting issue that I'll examine. Um, before I describe to you, so these are two standard slides I've been using in every uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's very useful to look at food 
as a food pyramid because it's a very useful way to convey information. How should you eat? That's a very important part of good life. How should we eat? And the food pyramid, which is always evolving, but it's a really good way to show both children, adults, grown-ups, elderly, how to eat. And this is a food pyramid from the Harvard um, Public Health uh, School. Uh, it's slightly different from the CDC, the Center of Disease Control Food Pyramid, because food pyramids are different from different people. But basically, the food pyramid is a very useful way to think of good eating. That you shouldn't eat just one thing. That's one of the messages. You shouldn't just eat meat. You should not just eat grain. You should not just drink milk only. Right? So if you say, I'm only going to drink milk, it won't feel good after a while. So having this mixture, which you can see over here, from grains to some proteins, from meat, dairy, whatever, uh, that's a good way of looking at how to eat well. And the interesting thing is, if you eat well, the earth is also well. So if you eat well on a local level, you're well and the earth is also well. So if you eat diversified foods, the farmer produces diversified foods and the soil supports diversified foods. And this is a long range, a lot of uh, uh, research has been done into it that if you eat well, the earth is also well. Of course, earth is always well. Earth is always well, but the Earth's ecosystem is well maintained for us and for other species. Uh, so I would like to show you the next uh, slide, which is this: how the, a similar kind of pyramid, not drawn like this. So just like in eating, you need a lot of different elements in your food to stay well. In your living, also a lot of different elements are needed to stay well. So I'm going to show you the equivalent pyramid for good life. So here are seven layers, just like the food pyramid has all these layers. Here are seven layers of good life. And this, these are represented in yoga as seven layers and interpreted. Um, so in yoga, they're represented more as metaphorical. Here it's very literal and interpreted in today's life. So the first is physical wellness. Right? So just like proteins, the basic building block, physical wellness. I want to be physically well. I want to be healthy, I want to have a safe house, I want, don't want to be fearful of others, I want to have safety in my life, so just physical wellness. Right? Uh, the second is having creativity in your life. If we only focus on physical wellness, it's like only eating meat. Uh, having creativity in your life. And everybody can be creative. Right? So from the poorest person to the wealthiest person, we can all be creative. Even people who may not have access to physical wellness in all its aspects, even they can be creative. It's the poorest person in the world can be creative. That is an important part of good life. If you don't have creativity, you're missing something. Thirdly, a multidimensional role in society or balance in life. You're participating in many aspects of life. You're individual, you're a family person, you belong to a family, you belong to a group. You're participating in many levels. Right? So having multidimensional uh, role in society. Very importantly, having love in your life. Right? That's a very important part of uh, wellness or having a good life. Having connection to others, people who love you, people you love, and taking responsibility in, in life. That's also part. So just going along this pyramid of good life, uh, expressing yourself, being able to express yourself. Uh, if you have all the well, all the goods in the world, all the wealth in the world, but you are not able to express yourself, your life is not good. Right? So having ability to express yourself. And having some harmony between your thought and speech. Not that you're thinking something and saying something completely different. That's not part of good life. Then contemplation and self-reflection, knowing yourself. Knowing yourself. Who am I? What are my uniqueness? Every one of us is unique in some ways. So knowing yourself and then taking time to meditate, to understand what is my purpose. That is also part of good life. And finally, uh, feeling connection to the universe, which we call spirituality, being connected to the universe, seeing yourself in others, seeing yourself in this whole great universe. So just like we have the pyramid for good food, this is a pyramid, a suggested pyramid, uh, and it embodies things that I think all of us feel. Yeah, th these are important issues. And just like if you participate in the full spectrum of the food pyramid, 
your life is sustained and the earth is sustained, if you participate in all of these, you can see that some of these important areas of good life hardly require any consumption. You don't need gasoline to be creative, you need gasoline to drive and have physical wellness. Uh, so sensual pleasures may require a lot of wealth, a lot of energy, but the others may not. But the important thing is to realize that is an important part of our dimension. Meditation, knowing yourself is an important part of a dimension. Uh, now, technology is starting to creep into these. So, for example, if you look at Facebook, in some ways, what is Facebook or other such social networks doing? They are real realizing that humans want to connect. Now, they may not be the best way to connect, but if we look at the success of some of these social networks, they are just fulfilling this intense need we have to connect with others. And of course, ideally you want some friends and face-to-face -face connection, but in absence of that, technologies are providing that ability to connect with others, feel like you're part of a group. Even if you're alone, you can connect with others. Uh, so YouTube, for example, and Twitter, for example, being able to express yourself. Right? So if you look at what is YouTube, it's people expressing themselves. They're shooting all kinds of videos, posting them, and then getting comments from others. Uh, you look at the power of Twitter um, in recent events in Middle East, how powerful these expression technologies were. This is what I feel. Do you feel this way? And entire regimes have been transformed, right? or at least in the process of transforming. However, in certain areas, technology has not yet participated. Right? So technology has not yet participated in areas like in meditation or spirituality, but there is a lot of opportunity there. Right? Uh, and I'll describe to you some of those opportunities. Now, in order to take any journey, and I'm, I'm coming to optoelectronics very quickly, but these are generic concepts, in order to accomplish anything, you have to take a journey. So whether it's physical wellness or creative wellness or meditation, you have to learn something, you have to find time, you have to take a journey. And in that journey, there are many steps and technology can help us in those steps. So I'll, I'll just point out some of the items in any journey. So whether it's an automobile journey, or you're taking a trip around the world, or you're wanting to be physically fit, um, or you want to have friends in your lives, all of those involve these eight concepts. First, understanding the rule, rules of the journey, and these check marks out of five, where technology is. Technology has helped us enormously understanding the rules, how the world works. In science, technology, we have all kind of resources at our fingertips. So four out of five, technology has made a lot of contribution through physics, fundamental sciences, uh, as well as general information. Uh, the infrastructure is needed to take a journey. Right? So if you want to drive a car somewhere, you need a car, you need roads, you need some uh, traffic signs. Technology has also made a lot of contributions there. The third element is dealing with stress. In any journey worth taking, there will be stress. And we don't still know how to deal with stress. So that's an area where technology has not made much of an impact. Uh, we are as stressed as somebody who actually never saw a computer. So the fact that we have a computer has certainly not made us less stressed. It may have made us more stressed. Uh, then fuel for the journey. You take a journey, you need some energy, you need some resources. Awareness of your strengths, uniquenesses. So this is where I mentioned contemplation, meditation, understanding yourself. There's been very little uh, contribution in, uh, from technology. Awareness of the outside world's challenges. That's also important, understanding where am I operating. Uh, then mindfulness, staying mindful in the moment. Uh, also very little contribution from technology. And finally, very important, ability to release the residue of the stress. So when the journey is finished, don't keep thinking about it, using up your energy. It's like if your journey is finished, you've driven your car to the parking lot, not being able to turn the car off. Right? So that happens a lot. We take a journey and we keep dwelling on it. We burn our nervous energy on it, like not being able to turn our car off. Now imagine how you would feel if you drove uh, to North Campus here, parked, and your car didn't turn off. And that happens to the mind all the time. We take a journey, our brain doesn't leave that journey. It's stuck. Right? So technology has done almost nothing there. Of course, the car does turn off, unfortunately. I, I looked on the internet um, 
how many cases there have been where cars did not turn off. And that's the beauty of internet, everything is there. Right? So there have been like five cases in the US where people drove their cars and couldn't turn them off. Um, and I don't want to degrade any company, but they were all Cadillacs. <laughs> <laughs> And in optimism, right? So in the area of optimism, what has technology done to make us feel optimistic? So these are some of the cultural areas where technology has not made. So let's start with optoelectronics. So I'll just uh, finish up. The technology has provided us a lot of things. And in the age of knowledge that we live in, uh, what is the value of information? So information is basically not scarce. Right? Uh, in the last talk, I mentioned to you that you can ask almost any question from a 10 year old and the person, the child can go to Wikipedia or any of the sources and answer that question like, uh, you know, how does the sun produce energy? What is the, what are the processes in fission? The child may not understand it, but look up and tell you exactly what happens. These are helium atoms. This is what happens. These are hydrogen atoms. Tell you about fission. Uh, so information has not, has lost a lot of its value because it's so pervasive. You don't need to be an expert to have information. Even knowledge has become a little less valuable because there are so many opinions and experts, and you can look up their opinions and expertise. Uh, so as we go down, the value, the scarcity has shifted. So 20, 30 years ago, of course, if you just knew something, you were, an ex you, you were valued. Uh, if you just knew certain pieces of information, you were considered an expert. Now those pieces of information are trivial now because everybody knows them. So the scarcity has started moving down from information, knowledge, and further down. So towards wisdom, towards being able to take an action, bringing harmony between your decision and action, your speech and action. So that's very scarce. Even now, uh, we all make, so this is February, uh, 1st of January, almost everybody makes some New Year's resolutions. And by February, they say, most of them have been forgotten. Okay? We can't harmonize our decision with our actions, right? So it's very scarce, it's very difficult to do that. And technology has not really made an impact. So scarcity is shifting down uh, from just information and knowledge to these other areas. And that's where technology can make an impact of course, you have to be very clever to find out, you know, how do I, how do I use technology uh, to release stress? Right? I'll show you some uh, ideas. Okay, so coming to optoelectronics now, uh, which is, as I said, very connect, connects very well to us. Uh, the modern optoelectronics essentially started with the photoelectric effect, uh, where these light beams were being, were impinging on a metal and electrons were coming out of the beam. And the photoelectric effect basically where people found that, well, if the light frequency is below a certain value, electrons don't come out even if the intensity is very, very high. You can shine as much light as you want, electrons won't come out. Right? And this was interpreted by Einstein. Right? So Einstein is usually known for his work on relativity. Right? But actually this is as important perhaps, it, and of course we are using it all the time. Uh, so Einstein explained the photoelectric effect by saying, well, light is made up of particles. It, uh, it's not made up of just waves uh, whose energy can be continuously increased. It's made up of particles and so a light beam consists of particles and each of those particles has energy h times the frequency, h is the Planck's constant and that's how light is. Right? So essentially all optoelectronics depends on this very simple, not simple, of course at that time, a leap a huge leap, right? So of course, uh, it was so ingrained that light is our waves, and even though before that, long time ago, there was the corpuscular theory of uh, light, that it's particles, but nobody had the idea that light is actually made up of photons coming in. So that was the first development, and this in conjunction with understanding electronic electrons by Schrodinger and Bohr, right? So they tried to explain Bohr first tried to explain why only certain kind of light comes out when atoms are excited. Right? So um, he explained spectroscopy. Uh, and then Schrodinger, who showed that electrons behave like waves. So these two ideas that waves, things we think as waves, behave as particles. 
and things we think of particles behave as waves. Right? So this duality in uh, nature that particles sometimes behave as waves and waves sometimes behave as particles is really central to optoelectronics. Okay, so after that, of course, um, there was a lot of technology, but basically when electrons jump from one energy to the, another energy, they emit a certain frequency or color of light. Right? So that is the essential outcome. And this has been used uh, very successfully in semiconductors. And uh, in semiconductors, electrons can jump from one energy level to another energy level, emit light, or they can also absorb light. So these simple processes, and I'll just flash just for completeness a few equations, uh, just to tell you that actually I know a little bit about this field. Uh, so. so this is uh, basically the Hamiltonian that allows us to calculate, understand, explain, design, all kinds of things, optical electronic devices, right? So this is a perturbation which comes from the electromagnetic field interacting with the electrons, and it is, this is an interesting concept, it creates or destroys a photon, right? Uh, which is very interesting because such, a, such language, creation and destruction, is also used in yoga 5,000 years ago. So this uh, idea of creation operators, destruction operators, they are also used, mentioned in some of the uh, classic uh, books or literature from 5,000 years ago. Of course, they were talking in very different concepts, but a similar concept is there. So you, you can excite, you can create a photon, you can destroy a photon, which is emission and absorption. Uh, and these are just Maxwell's equations, and when they are quantized, when they are put in the form of second quantization, you can essentially predict and calculate all kind of optoelectronic properties. <clears throat> okay, so you can have in semiconductors, and semiconductors come in many forms, uh, both organic and inorganic. Uh, you can have lasers, which can emit single frequency, almost single frequency light. You can have light emitting diodes. You can have light detectors. And next talk in this series is going to be on energy. And solar cells, I just mentioned here, and I'm going to talk about solar cells are an important contribution that semiconductors make to renewable energy. You can have imagers, cameras, you can have light modulators, uh, like what I'm using here, uh, which are liquid crystal displays, as well as some new uh, technologies of MEMS mirrors, where you can control small mirrors and control light, right? so like light walls. Uh, and this has led to enormous number of technologies. Um, and optoelectronics opti uh, opti is now pervasive, right? So every one of you, I'm sure, is carrying something with you which has optoelectronics, right? So whether the uh, cell phone you're carrying and the display of the cell phone, or <coughs> in your laptop, you may have a CD reader uh, or a DVD player, uh, all of that has optoelectronics. So everything, we have optoelectronics everywhere. So communication, display, energy conversion, detection, spectroscopy, education, wellness, everywhere we have optoelectronics. And this is just a, a sort of a chart of showing how optoelectronics married with electronics, right? married with electronics has become just part of everyday life. So we just take it for granted that we have optoelectronics. So even this laser pointer, all the way to this laptop, the display, the whole imaging, and you watching it, uh, everything is optoelectronics. Okay, so just uh, some cartoons showing you uh, <coughs> what semiconductors can do. So in semiconductors, typically this is a, for example, light emission system where electrons come in, and these wells kind of show some of the state-of-the-art devices that are used. Uh, so electrons come in, they come down here, and this is, these are energies. They jump down, combine with empty states, which we call holes, and they emit light. And the color of the light can be controlled by changing the band gap. Right? So you can produce different kind of colors, different kind of uh, uh, <coughs> outcomes. And so you can produce different, you can produce red, you can produce green, you can produce blue, and so on. Uh, here's a typical laser system, it's emitting light. Um, it, and light can be emitted from the edge, from the vertical. Uh, so these are devices that are now just everywhere. So this laptop has uh, lasers. This laser pointer, of course, has a laser. Uh, lasers are 
used a lot. Uh, these are some more interesting optoelectronic devices uh, which are used for, so this is what we call sub, inter subband detectors and emitters, long wavelength lasers and detectors. So these are used for night vision application, being able to see at night. Um, and this particular structure is used, but there are many other structures as well, right? So you are able to see at night. Um, and you've seen probably some of these images, blurry thermal images of people walking around in night or uh, doing other things. And night vision uh, is, has become an important technology. Now, where, where optoelectronics plays a very important role is in the area of lighting and displays, uh, both in liquid crystal displays, but also light emitting diodes. So the color of the light that is emitted, as I mentioned, depends on the energy that the electron loses when it jumps from one state to the other. And so if the energy is small, you can have red light. If the energy is a little larger, you can have other, other colors. Uh, <clears throat> and in this area, uh, immense development that has happened over the last 10-15 years is the occurrence of the semiconductor system which are called nitrides made from indium nitride, gallium nitride, aluminum nitride system and I'll just briefly uh, review that for you. So nitrides which have this the crystal structure of nitrides, uh, they can produce blue light. Right? So nitrides can produce blue light. We always have red and green for many many years for uh, decades, but the blue light is relatively new. And by combining uh, these three, you can produce white light. Now, typically, in and you have seen in Ann Arbor, for example, a lot of the street lighting is white LEDs, right, which are made from nitrides. Uh, now, in the nitride, you don't have a blue and uh, a red and yellow source, uh, or red and green source. Uh, the blue source provides all the lights. Right? So you, you pr pr produce blue light, then it shines on a fluorescent material, produces green light, shines on a red material, produces red fluorescent. So the blue light can produce other colors also. And that's what used in. So this is just a projection of um, the solid state lighting devices as a function of time. And the solid state lighting devices have started coming into technology a few years ago, 2007. And they're, they're rapidly projected to increase. And that is bringing in some very interesting technologies to the home user. And uh, bringing in things that are that were not possible. Because not only is solid state electronics controlled by electronics important for just white light, you can produce any color, you can produce any scenery, you can produce any mood, you can produce a lot of creative art once you have this technology. And I'll show you a picture from Norway uh, regarding such a technology. Then in addition to that, we have the display technologies like this laptop uh, screen that I have, which is based on liquid crystal displays. Um, and that's another part of the technology where you can modulate light by just aligning the molecules of the liquid crystal. And this technology integrated with the thin film technology allows us to have displays, not only hard displays like on this laptop, but also flexible displays. Right? So, uh, and the displays become almost like having a paper, even paper displays are coming in. And all of this, of course, driven by Moore's law, uh, the electronics becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and just as an example, the cost of a transistor, which is always, of course, important in optoelectronics, in 1970 was $5 and 2012 is a billionth of a dollar. Right? So basically costless, has almost no cost. The transistors that control the intelligence of these devices. And then this is the first uh, ARPANET, uh, but now of course internet connects everywhere. You can have uh, wireless almost anywhere in the world. Right? Other than a few regions, you have access to wireless everywhere because of satellites and so on. So optoelectronics are not spread from being just in some places, to lasers and LEDs and these things, just in high-tech labs and facilities, it has spread to everybody, right? It has spread to the individual. And that is really important because the individual having control over technology can impact technology in ways that are very different than if corporations or big countries have control over technology. Right? Uh, so, of course, 
to exercise that control, we need to understand some idea, have some idea of technology and be willing and able to use it and, re and understand what benefits could come out of that. So this is a flexible display and of course semiconductors are inorganic, they're also organic semiconductors which are flexible, bendable, polymers, all kinds of things. <clears throat> so the question is, technologies of course can be empowering, they can also be enslaving. It's an, and we all understand that. Just like a hammer, if you have a hammer, uh, you can build a house, you can build a beautiful building, you can also hit somebody on the head or hit yourself on your thumb right, and crush your thumb. And uh, so technology is something that you can use any way you want. So understanding and using technology is up to you and me. Right? So uh, technology is something that is not going to provide you, uh, it's just going to provide you tools. And if you're not wise, of course, the tools are, could be misused as well as used properly. So everywhere we have intelligence, we have technology. Right? So how do we actually use it? Uh, <clears throat> of course, technology is being used in many places. Uh, so to connect people like Skype, the, the technology of Skype, where you can talk to people all over the world. If you're taking a trip, you can talk to your children at home. Uh, you can talk to your friends and uh, almost have a conversation. It's really interesting to see some of these conversations. Um, <clears throat> of course, when the cell phones came out, um, it almost seemed like people were going crazy right? because people were chatting with themselves. Right? So you could walk down the street and people were talking. And initially it was like, what are they talking about? Why are they talking? Uh, have they gone mad? And you would look at them and you think, well, they look pretty you know, reasonable, but what's going on? Uh, and the Skype is also very interesting because sometimes I go to a cafe and somebody's Skyping. And uh, Skyping is even more, you know, it's beyond cell phone because you're making faces, you're laughing at somebody because you're actually just like sitting in front of them. And uh, it's very interesting to see that, but it's a great tool. It's a great tool. If it's used uh, well, it's a great tool because you can connect to people anywhere in the world and be part of people's lives. You can uh, see what's going on. Uh, of course, Technology in education, in healthcare. Uh, if you go to uh, a medical facility, uh, it has like it's just packed with technology, right? and also remote healthcare now, which is very, very. Uh, it's fantastic that doctors can share their expertise in areas where there are no expert physicians, and that is extremely useful for uh, people who are in remote areas and don't have resources. Uh, <clears throat> again. Technology connects, allows us to learn, um, etc. And the great creative shift is that technology has started to move from big studios or big corporations to me and you. So I can produce a YouTube video and I can post it and if I have something interesting to say, I can say it to the world. Uh, I can say it to myself, I can create an entire culture around myself. Uh, I have that power. Uh, and so Cameras have become so inexpensive and software to tailor uh, video clips has become so uh, easily available that you don't actually have to be a technologist to use it. And that is really important that people who are not technologists can contribute as much to technology as people who are actually engineers. And that is a remarkable thing uh, which all of us have to cherish and use. Uh, so what is YouTube? YouTube is basically you're able to do things that big studios used to be able to do. Right? So studios like MGM or Universal or these studios who were out there with millions and millions of dollars and all this control, they have to now compete with a very creative individual person. And sometimes the YouTube videos actually have more uh, people viewing them than big movies. In fact, I personally almost have never gone to see a movie because they're so you know, uncreative. So it allows the individual to be creative uh, in ways, of course you can waste your time also, right? uh, that also is there. It's like, you know, with a hammer you can hit yourself on the thumb and then just go crying. Uh, so you have to be mindful of the technology. So technology has now come to the point where there is a great role for humanists in technology. Right? And that's really important. Because, of course, in this university, we have the North Campus and we have the Central Campus. And um, there's a 
big divide between the two. The way we think is very different. Um, engineers have a certain way of thinking, and of course that's conducive to producing technology, and humanists have a different way of thinking, but they both want the good life. And so if you ask a student in English literature, you ask a student in uh, electrical engineering or computer science or mechanical engineering, everybody wants a good life. Right? But this is a moment, uh, and technology has brought us here, where there's a strong opportunity for collaboration. Uh, if you look at Steve Jobs, who ran Apple, uh, he was certainly not an engineer. Right? Uh, he was a creative person. And uh, <clears throat> he basically, he, he claims in his, uh, you know, his autobiography as well as otherwise, that the most important course he ever took was a course in calligraphy, right? just writing. Uh, so, and he was, he's an example, he was an example of somebody coming from humanist side contributing enormously to technology. But everybody can contribute now. And that's the great thing, that the democratization of technology that I can have, I can have, uh, and I, I travel sometimes to India and I go to my village, and there are just small farmers in my village. My, my uncle, my mother's brother, is a small farmer, and he has in his hand a smartphone where he can browse the internet, he can look at wheat prices in Dubai, he can look at, uh, he can talk to his cousins in Hong Kong, and he's not a rich man. Technology has started penetrating uh, almost everywhere, so everybody can make a contribution. So the state of technology now offers great opportunity for both technologists and humanists to contribute together. Because after all, technology has to have content. Uh, if you have a, a channel or if you have a media outlet, it has to have a content. And the great thing is the content can be controlled by you and me. And that's where I think a, a lot of uh, great stuff can come out in today as well as in the future, uh, that we can produce cultural content and we can share it around the world. Of course, we should be should recognize this opportunity and then use it, uh, not just engineers, but also people in the humanities. So, some of the challenges that technology has not met. Right? So I'm gonna just go over that. Uh, technology has done a lot of things for us and we all understand that, but there are certain areas where technology has contributed almost nothing. In fact, it's become very distractory, uh, distracting uh, to our good life. So, some of the areas where technology is not contributed, uh, relates to this, relates to our brain. Uh, that are, there are critical parts of our brain that are still completely primitive. So we live in today's world with all this technology around us, but in some parts, our brain acts as if we were cavemen or cave women. So these are some of the areas. For example, we still associate familiarity, familiarity with safety. That's a very primitive notion that if you see something every day, it must be safe. And we know that's not the case, right? One of the most dangerous things is driving a car, but we totally feel safe, right? On the other hand, we feel very unsafe going on an airplane. It's not such a familiar experience. Uh, I was reading the other day that one of the most dangerous tools that almost every, especially in this country, almost every American household has is the power saw. But we feel so comfortable with the power saw. We just pick it up and turn it on and boom, we cut a piece of wood and then cut our thumb also. <laughs> so we are very comfortable with technology or things that we are familiar with, even though they may be very, very dangerous. And I was reading there are almost 700,000 visits to the doctor just from the power saw in this country. And in 40,000, every year, 40,000 people lose their one of the digits from the power saw. And yet the technology exists to completely stop the power saw as, if, as soon as it touches uh, the flesh, because it's just electronics. Right? And electronics is so much faster. So very simple technology exists, which you can attach. Uh, it's called the saw stop. You can look at it on the internet. It's called the saw stop. It costs about $100, um, but nobody wants to use it because they think, oh, power saw is such a safe thing. You know, why would 40,000 people lose their fingers or thumbs, and if they are carpenters, they lose their livelihood. Because, of course, a lot of construction workers use power. Uh, so this is a very primitive part of our brain, which says if you are with things you know, 
you must be safe. Conversely, if you are among strangers or people who don't look like you or people who seem like different, then be scared of them. And that's also very primitive and it's mostly incorrect. So we have tremendous fear of people who may not look like us. In the process, we lose tremendous opportunities. So that part of the brain, even though we live in this hyper-intelligent society and culture, we still think the same way, for most of us, unless we are enlightened, you know, and I'm sure many of uh, you in the audience are enlightened, but by and large, we still think the same way. So it's a very primitive thinking, which has had no impact from technology. Then beyond a certain level of threshold of stress, we throw out all our understanding and logic and learning. That's also very primitive. Right? So you can see sometimes, uh, and I've seen personally myself, and I've personally participated in such an activity which I'm really ashamed of, that sometimes under, after a certain stress, you act like a complete fool. Right? And I've done that myself, and every time I recall that, I'm horrified. How could I do that? But that happens to all of us because that's again a very primitive hardwiring of our brain that beyond a certain threshold of stress, we completely ignore everything that is rational and intelligent and it happens in stock market crashes, it happens in foreclosures, it happens every day with the advertisement. So it's so easy to fool our brain. So once we are past a certain level of stress, we completely act in ways that where if we were to look at ourselves, we would be so embarrassed. And we are embarrassed, right? So a lot of resources are wasted because we don't know how to deal with stress. So stress has become, in the modern life, stress has become the most critical challenge to our good life, right? being unable to handle stress. And also we want to hoard even if there's no scarcity. Right? And I was mentioning the level of scarcity has shifted from you know, maybe 100 years ago there was a scarcity of food, but we still eat like there's not going to be food tomorrow. Right? Uh, so we still behave in certain ways where if there's no scarcity, we know there's no scarcity of food, you're not going to starve tomorrow, but yet you see people uh, eating like this is their last meal. There's no scarcity. We hoard, we put things in our houses as if they're never going to be another time. It's like the famine is coming, the earth is coming down to uh, end, the world is ending. We pack things in our houses, we buy huge homes, so we hoard, we bring material stuff into our lives when there's no scarcity. And we know there's no scarcity. So our brain still thinks very primitively. Like, of course, the cavemen had to hoard stuff, right? If you, if you find a dead elephant, you have to drag it in, right? because who knows when you're going to eat again. But we are not living in that world, right? so we still behave the same way. And technology has no, made no impact. It's still very difficult to learn, right? Uh, it's still very hard to learn. Uh, and that's another challenge to our brain. Okay, so there are challenges to our body also. So our body has not really, so even though we have all this technology, and at the speed of fractions of seconds, I can calculate all kinds of things and understand all kinds of things, the body still behaves the same way. But Technology can bring this. It's a fake sunrise, but it has an important impact on us, right? And optical uh, displays have started coming into therapies. Right? So light therapy is becoming more and more important, but one can bring it into our own lives. Right? So one can bring such technologies uh, into our own lives. Uh, there's an interesting concept I want to share with you, which comes from yoga, how to deal with stress. So in yoga, there is a technique, of course, yoga, uh, one of its uh, great, um, at least claims, is that it can help reduce or release, completely eliminate stress. So the yoga uses a concept of asana, which is a stressful posture. Uh, so what yoga suggests is stress rarely comes. It comes once in a while and you're, you're surprised by the stress. So in yoga, what is done is you are placed in a st highly stressful situation of your own choosing. Right? So a yoga teacher may say, take a certain posture, which is stressful. You can see this posture is not quite comfortable. Then you hold it for a very long time. And initially when you hold it, your brain reacts in its primitive way. It becomes anxious. It becomes annoyed. It starts thinking, when is it going to end? 
and you start losing your sense of calmness. But you practice it and after a little while, your brain becomes completely calm. And there are hundreds of such postures that have been developed in yoga and that's really the basis of many of the things yoga does, that it places you in a simulation stress that is not real because you know I can always come out or somebody can come out of this posture, but it trains the brain to take on a highly stressful situation, then breathe very slowly, calmly, and hold that stressful situation for a long time, then longer time, then longer time, till your brain is completely unaffected by the stress and you just enjoy that moment. Because you're so much in the moment that you just enjoy the moment. Right? So this is the way yoga approaches and suggests. And this is actually done all the time in technology. This approach is used in technology all the time, and I'll show you. And this is one of the ways that technology can contribute to how to handle stress. So, for example, the road rage. If you were in a situation where somebody was shouting at you on the road every day, after a while it'll have no impact on you. If it happens suddenly, one day, and usually it happens suddenly, right? So suddenly somebody screams at you, or uh, it cuts you off then it produces a, that primitive reaction. But if it was happening every day, for example, I've driven in Delhi, and the kind of cutting and you know, things in Delhi are just every day it happens, right? So you drive in Delhi, and uh, you're in a car, or you're in a scooter, or whatever, and every five seconds, somebody's shouting at you. And after a while, you don't care. Right? You completely don't care. And here, when I drive here, somebody shouts at me or you know, gives me the finger, it has no effect. Right? <laughs> because I'm so used to that. And uh, that's, an, that's a very important technique. And this is basically what yoga summarizes in a different way, that take on the stress all the time. Right? Repeatedly take on the stress, and after a while your brain will be trained. Your hard wiring will train, or your threshold will move up so high that you never go into that zone where you let your rational and wise brain, you don't discard your wise brain, you keep it in. So, where is it used? This approach, which I just described to you, is used all the time in flight training. So, when you go into an airplane, one of the most challenging things in the world, like a pilot is flying the plane. Now, it's very rare that the pilot will encounter an enormous turbulence, that the plane will drop 50 feet, or some shear will come in. So the flight simulator, this is Boeing's flight simulator, what does it do? It places the pilot under intense, stressful situations continuously. So you take the flight training, and of course, nature rarely provides those opportunities or those challenges where the pilot may find the plane under intense stress. Like the wind's extremely large, or landing gear has some, some unusual thing has happened. And just to make sure that the pilot has encountered those situations before they actually happen, because you don't want the pilot to respond with the primitive brain that the plane drops 20 feet and the pilot just panics, right? You want the plane to be, the pilot to encounter the situations many, 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 many times. And that's what the flight simulator does. And that's what yoga does. So what I just described to you, in yoga, you're put under intense stress situation for in every class or every, uh, you know, if you work with a teacher, the teacher will say, take this intense stressful position and stay calm, and stay calm, and stay calm, and stay calm, till it becomes a habit, right? Uh, and that's what the flight simulator does. Right? Of course, the flight simulator is very expensive, right? So we can't, and the situation that the pilot has to deal with are very different from our situation. So technologies, that will create simulations where you can encounter difficult coworkers, coworkers which are just, or bosses who are just very difficult to deal with, they can be created in technology, just like the flight simulator. Right now the technologies are not there, but they're going to happen. And I, I personally am involved in many such technologies where artificial stresses are going to be created in front, in a very realistic situation, uh, fear of failure, loneliness, financial challenges, road rage. So all these stressful modern life stresses can be created in technology and just like the pilot learns through the flight simulator how to actually deal with real life situ situations. 
In fact, without the flight simulators, uh, the pilot training would be so much more difficult, right? Because where do you encounter those, those uh, situations are rare. They may happen, a pilot may fly, you know, a thousand hours and encounter one stressful situation. And if it's just one after a thousand hours, you're not ready. Uh, so, optoelectronics provides us, displays creativity, provides us this ability to create situations which are highly stressful, which are important in our lives because they ruin our good life and then allow us to deal with them. And as we deal with them repeatedly, our brain gets rewired. Right? Brain literally gets rewired. It thinks in a different way. And a primitive way of thinking where stress means adrenaline, kick, hurt, beat, run, all those things. They're very primitive, so we can overcome that. And technology is just perfect for that. Just like the flight simulator, this is technology. Right? So it's simulating uh, challenges for the pilot that kind, right? So optoelectronics uh, technologies where stress simulation can be created. Now, of course, optoelectronics has completely penetrated the gaming market, right? So if you look at the uh, Kinect, the Xbox, um, kids playing with the, but they're still at the level where, you know, they're just for fun. But the next level where we will be, where they will provide rewiring of our brain Right? Not by actually physically going in there, not by drugs, right? You can rewire your brain with, with drugs also, right? Uh, you can take some uh, potent drug and rewire your brain, and I don't recommend that, right? Uh, this is different. This is where you actually encounter the situation, then you learn how to deal with the situations. And initially, it may create anxiety, panic, and all that stuff, but after a little while, you'll be amazed. And, and practicing yoga, I know that for sure. Uh, that your reaction completely changes. So these are very important new technologies. So not only for physical activities, but to learn. Uh, and as the population demographics of the world becomes older, old old age diseases, uh, which are basically you know suffering from brain diseases, right? Either memory loss, dementia, all these things. Uh, so neuroplasticity, plasticity where the brain is actually being rewired, re readjusted, uh, technology, in my view, can play an enormous role in that area. Uh, <clears throat> so technology eventually becoming like a mentor, right? So this is from Greek mytho mythology, uh, this Telemachus mentor, who was apparently a mentor to a guide to this prince uh, in Greek mythology, uh, technology will become or can become, have has the opportunity of becoming a mentor, right? So where it mentors me. So I know, you know, here are some things that I need to work on. I get mad at certain things. I get upset at my children and I don't want to get upset at my children. There's no reason I should be get, getting upset. How do I train myself not to do that, right? Or I eat a certain way, right? So I eat uh, very slow or very fast or eat a lot of stuff, right? Uh, physically, I know, intellectually, I know I shouldn't do that. Right? I know when I see these desserts, I shouldn't just gobble them up. Right? I know that. How do I train myself? Right? So technology can help us. Just like I mentioned, the flight simulator for the pilot or yoga for the practicing yogi, uh, it trains you to think differently, act differently. And that is extremely essential in good life, in providing good life, uh, where you have to think a little differently than what the culture is telling you. Right? So culture says, think like this, and that's the norm. Right? How do you escape that? How do you relearn? And uh, so this, uh, I just mentioned to you, this uh, amygdala, this little uh, almond type thing here, which under stress completely bypasses all our logic. It's in the brain, there is this uh, amygdala uh, where if your stress level goes above a certain level, and everybody has a different threshold, and the idea is to enhance this threshold so much uh, through practice, training, uh, but once that threshold is ex exceeded, this amygdala takes over, and the rest of the brain just becomes a zombie. Right? And uh, we act like something we ourselves cannot recognize uh, in ourselves. So that's uh, essentially uh, what I wanted to convey. Now, as at the end of the talk, we always do this uh, thing, and uh, we are all here, so let's stand up. And I'm going to take you through laughter yoga. <laughs> So uh, be ready to, and open up your lungs so you can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, <clears throat> so we'll end with laughter yoga. This is a, a laughter yoga session I led in the ARB, an Arbor, uh, Arbor, Arboretum uh, in October for a TEDx talk. So let's stand with our heels touching and pulling your shoulders back like you're opening your heart and behave like you're not engineers, right? You're not engineers, but you're dancers, right? So I want you to behave like you're dancers, not engineers. Uh, touch your fingers together and stand tall like you're warriors now, right? Like you're performing a drama. On the inhale, we'll bring arms up, reaching up towards the sky. On the exhale, we'll come back. Very slow inhale, very slow exhale. We'll do two of those and then we'll do the laughter yoga. So let's slowly inhale. And exhale. And once more. Feel like you can touch the sky. And exhale. And just release your shoulders, open your chest. And now we'll do the laughter yoga. So we'll inhale the same way. When we come back, we we'll laugh as hard as you can. So on the exhale, laugh as hard as you can. We we'll do three laughter sessions. So let's touch our fingers, open your chest, and stand like a warrior, like you're a warrior on a stage. And let's inhale up. And get ready. And ha! <laughs> let's do two more. A little louder. <laughs> and one more. <laughs> and just shake out and that's the end of the talk and thanks for coming. <laughs>